I'm going to be talking about metaprogramming. Um, a little bit about me, I'm Adi, uh, my pronouns are he, him, and uh, I work as a senior software engineer, been working with Elixir for five years. I love catching software bugs, love tester and development, Elixir, and theoretical physics. So if people want to talk about those things, hit me up. My GitHub and Twitter handles are up there. Also, by the way, there's my cat, Leslie, he's, he's really cute. Um, so today we'll be talking about what metaprogram is and when to use it. And then we'll talk about metaprogram in, in Elixir and how Elixir does it a little differently than many languages. Um, and then, you know, we'll do some live coding. This is like my first conference talk and I was thinking, what's the most deterministic sure shot thing I could do, right? I was like, live coding always goes as planned, right? So we're gonna do some live coding and hopefully we'll have some time towards the end for some questions. Um, all right, so metaprogramming is like best described as like code that writes code. Um, what that really means is like a program that has the ability to generate code, analyze other code, store information off re related to another code, or inject behavior into another code. Uh, so essentially code that treats other code as data or argument is like called a meta program. And the language in which we write the meta program is called the meta language. Many modern languages are their own meta language, uh, like Elixir, and that's called reflectivity. Uh, so that really allows us to really ex extend the features of Elixir in Elixir itself. And here's an example, right? Phoenix Strata pipeline. Um, so let's look at that a little bit uh, more in depth. Um, so this pipeline is allowing us to define a route. Uh, this is like a Phoenix Strata pipeline, right? So it allows us to define a get route, which accepts JSON and is delegated to a controller, right? It's nine lines of code is pretty cool, right? So that's one of the pros of metaprogramming. It, it hides complexity of an implementation therefore makes it easier for us to digest the code, furthermore, increasing our productivity, right? And it also automates like a lot of tedious boilerplate code. And the best part about that is that you don't have to worry about standardization, right? Because people are not doing that code differently. Um, so those are some pros of metaprogramming, but on the other side, since it's hiding complexity of, of implementation, it is also decreasing transparency. So it's harder for you to kind of break the, uh, convention here, right? If you do something that's that's not supported by this interface, it's a lot harder to change the code that's under the hood. Um, and metaprogramming increases overall complexity of the code. So the code is harder to test, debug, and maintain, right? Um, so uh, let's, yeah, now that we know pros and cons, let's see when we should use metaprogramming. Uh, the best answer is like when you've exhausted all the other options, <laughs> but a few other points that I came up with are like say, when you've minimized the meta code, and that's an extension of, you know, separating your interface from implementation, right? So like your, your interface, the meta code should be completely, not completely, but like somewhat independent of the implementation. So you can test those independently, maintain those independently. And speaking of testing, you should make sure that you've thoroughly tested your meta program, right? And because it's more complex, right? So it's like less deterministic. So you have to rely more on, on tests to make sure it behaves the way you expect it to. And uh, also you should make sure your code is inspectable. And this is something a lot of meta programs don't have, I feel um, like uh, extra introspective features that allow us to hook into you know, the DSL and see how things are, right? It should be more debuggable. So if you just put a little bit extra thought into making your meta program more debuggable, it'll be easier to maintain and adopt. And two other things, it's good to use meta program when the requirements are less volatile, uh, when you're very sure about the interface, it, it takes like less heavy maintenance. And obviously since no code is perfect, uh, you should expect failure. And when the cost of failure is manageable, you should use meta programming. But it's metaprogram is not evil, right? We just may, need to make sure you put thought behind it and look and consider the future of your code before using it. All right, so now that's out, out of the way, let's talk about metaprogramming in Elixir. And uh, in Elixir, unlike some of the other languages, uh, metaprogramming is a little bit more restrictive, which is what I like about it. Uh, there's less ways people can mess up. Um, and that's because metaprogramming essentially revolves around three pillars in Elixir. And the first one is the Elixir representation of the AST. Abstract syntax tree, for those who don't know, is uh, like a, um, a tree representation of your tokens 
and um, uh, after, and, that, and that happens after like syntactical and lexical analysis of the code, right? And Elixir has an Elixir representation of ASD and they, those are called coded expressions or coded literals. Um, second pillar are macros that allow us to inject behavior. And third pillar of metaprogramming are compile time callbacks, uh, which hook into the compilation of a module and further allow us to change the behavior of, of a module. So quoted expressions, like I said, are Elixir representation of the AST. Um, to get the Elixir representation of the AST, we can use a quote keyword. Um, so for example, if we do quote one plus two, um, we get a three element tuple. Doesn't really look like a tree, right? But the first element, the function, which is plus, can be thought of as the root of the tree. And the arguments one and two, which are the third element, are the leaf or like the nodes of that root. Um, the second element of this tuple is just metadata, just to give us more information of where the function has been called and what modules have been imported. Here's like a bigger AST, I guess. There's three operations happening here, multiplication, plus, and minus. And multiplication is a root operation, and plus and minus are like the child operations. And you can, I've just like ign uh, kind of ignored the metadata here, but you can see it's a three element tuple and the third element has two three element tuples. So that's how you can nest multiple quoted expressions. Okay, so now that we know what quoted expressions look like, let's, there's, let's see the way we can evaluate that. There's something called code.evalQuoted function. And this allows us to evaluate a quoted expression um, given an environment. Um, so expression one plus two, if you do code.evalQuoted, you get three. Um, and it also returns a set of variable bindings, which are defined. And since no variables are defined here, it returns an empty list. Um, okay, this one's fun. So you can also merge two quoted expressions. Uh, and this is not like the traditional way to do that, but uh, say we have a quoted expression one plus A, we can define another expression A where, or where A equals two. We can define an expression block, right? And combine those two expressions, giving them as third arguments, making sure A is defined before one plus A. And then when we evaluate it, you get three along with, hey, A is defined as two, right? And this is not how we usually do it, but I just want to really emphasize the fact that core expressions are just three element tuples that you can manually merge them into a block. All right, whenever we talk about evaluation of quotes, you'll hear the word hygiene a lot. And what hygienic really means is that variables don't leak across scopes. Uh, uh, so essentially, if something that, that's defined outside of a quoted expression, it cannot uh, be used inside a quoted expression and something that's defined inside cannot be used outside. So if uh, we define B equals two inside a quote and evaluate it, we still get undefined function B outside the quote. Similarly, if you have A outside the quote and you want to use it inside the quote, you cannot use it. But there are ways you can kind of cross that boundary using var and unquote functions. So let's look at var. Um, you can use var, uh, you can, if, you, if you define a quote expression using var, it says, okay, um, I expect there to be a variable at the time of eval evaluation. So when you evaluate it, you have to pass A as two, and then it can evaluate that as three. Um, and unquote, however, expects something to be there at the time of definition. So it wants it to be uh, A to be defined right there as two. Um, so you don't have to pass uh, a variable binding here. So unquote is a way to kind of inject um, across that boundary at the time of definition of the quoted expression. And var is a way to do that at the time of evaluation of the quoted expression. All right, so we have all the ingredients needed to do code injection right now. We don't need macros. Um, we can literally define a function that returns a quoted expression, hello world, and call, call, call code.evalQuoted, and that just defines that function, right? But that's not the right way of doing it in Elixir. Uh, one of the reasons is that you can pass, you know, many environments, bindings, and whatever. Um, it needs to be a little bit more restrictive, and macro is a way to do that. Um, you can define a macro, which defines a quoted expression, you can require the module and call that macro and that has the same impact. Um, and this happens because of a process during compilation called macro expansion where uh, Elixir makes sure that this, uh, the, whatever quoted expressions are returned by the macro are evaluated with the proper environment. Um, there's also a special macro called using, 
Um, so if you have the using macro, if you change the old code to using, you can just use a macro calling the use keyword. You don't have to require it and invoke the macro manually. And this is like the uh, proper way, I guess the default way to inject behavior. You should use using macro as a, as a default. Um, great, the third pillar were compile time hooks. And there's three or compile time callbacks. Uh, and they really allow us to hook into compilation or module and change its behavior. And there's three compile time callbacks. Um, first one is before compile which is, as the name suggests, invoked right before the module is compiled and its byte code is generated. Um, it takes an environment as an argument and needs to be defined in a different module because um, the module isn't done compiling. So let's look at the old code we had, uh, the using macro, right? And we can replace that with before compile instead of using and just invoke it using, well, it's not quite invoking, but if you replace use with at before compile, it has the same effect. The difference here is that when you call at before compile, it's not really invoking it right there. It is just registering a callback. Callback is registered after the rest of the body of the module is compiled. So that's the difference between the use and before compile here, which it, it doesn't really show in the code here, unfortunately. Um, the other uh, callback is after compile, which again, name suggests is invoked after a module is compiled. Um, and it takes environment as, and, byte, and byte code both as arguments because we have byte code available now. And it can be defined in the same module itself because the module is done compiling. So uh, for example, if we have defined after compiling the module itself and it just prints compiled current module, once you compile the file, it will print compiled test, right? So it can be used for like logging or anything. <laughs> um, now, third one is on definition. And uh, this one's a little different because it only allows us to use functions and not macros. So you cannot call macros. And that's because this is invoked whenever a function or a macro is done defining, right? Um, so, the, and you cannot use macros here because it's, it's, an, it's Elixir's way of restricting us from again, further breaking things, right? Uh, What's weird about this is it takes six arguments. I don't even remember all those six, <laughs> but in this example, you can see uh, there's name and body. So if you have an on definition defined with six arguments, third one is name, last one's body, and it just prints defining a function named name with body, the string version of the body. And you define that hook. Whenever you define a function, it prints that when it's compiled. So yeah, these three are like comp compile time hooks and these can be used to, again, inject behavior into um, a module's compilation. So quick summary, in Elixir metaprogramming revolves around three constructs, quarter literals, macros, and compile time callbacks. Quarter literals are Elixir's representation of the abstract syntax tree, which by default are evaluated hygienically. And to add more dynamic behavior to them, we could use var, which adds it at evaluation time and unquote, which adds it at the time of definition. Macros are used to inject behavior by default. It's a right way to use uh, inject behavior at compile time and uh, compile time callbacks uh, are used to run tasks by hooking into the compilation for module. And that task could be invoking a macro uh, or adding a uh, uh, behavior <laughs> through macro. Um, Metaprogramming should be used carefully, like we talked earlier, as it makes your code more complex. Your code is of higher order because you know, it treats other code as arguments. Um, and a great use case of metaprogramming is DSL because um, a DSL, when you say, you're being explicit about the fact that you're just creating an interface for a deeper implementation. And all you're doing is trying to make the code more digestible, like the Phoenix router DSL. So sp speaking of DSL, let's build a DSL today. Uh, we're gonna build a DSL, which will help us compose music and use some of the things we l learned today, right? And this is what it looks like, kind of looks like the Phoenix router, right? It, it's supposed to. <laughs> so we'll be hooking into Alsa's A play command to play a note. And uh, that's, yeah, yeah, and we'll use that further in the DSL, right? And we need to define a sequence of notes. Um, and as you can see, notes have like a class C, D, E, F, or rest, that means no note. Um, and it should have some defaults like for volume, duration, octet, and, as, and those things. You should be able to define multiple sequences and embed sequences into another sequence. 
and this is where like uh, it's a little different from Phoenix pipeline. You cannot embed a pipeline into another pipeline. Um, so that's the only difference here. Uh, otherwise, it looks very similar. And at the very end, we need to define a function play, which allows to play a sequence that's defined in the module. Great. So what's already done? I have already defined a node struct, right? That represents a node with class modifier octet. Um, I have um, defined a node player module, which allows us to play a node. Um, well, taking a node. I have added unit integration tests, very detailed tests, um, as because I love TDD, like I mentioned. Uh, also, we, I'll not be able to cover all the tests today, but I will try to make the code accessible after the talk if you want to look at how I test my meta program. Um, there's many comments and like many ways I do that testing. Some, some, some might be a little uh, different. <laughs> um, and last, I have written this, put a lot of work into this super awesome track uh, that will only work one, if you finish our DSL. So that's like incentive for us to finish. All right, so to do, um, we need it using macro so we can call use DSL, right? We need a sequence macro and to store a list of all nodes and we need a note macro, right? Which adds to the current sequence. We also need an embed notes macro, which uses a previously defined sequence to update the current sequence. And we need to define a, the play function in the current module that you know can play a list of given, se uh, given sequence. All right, so let's get to it. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and get to, get to the terminal. Um, okay, and I'll be actually coding on my Linux machine and I'm mirroring it using Tmux because a, a play is like best on Linux. So I'm just gonna run mix test and just make sure you guys can hear it. Um, if I could get like a thumbs up, that'd be great. But can you hear this? Awesome, awesome. So uh, this is my test, which just plays a note. And um, I'll just quickly show you how the note looks like. Uh, again, it's a struct and there's like a way to convert a note to a frequency. Um, this is already defined. And there's a note player with give, which given a note, plays a note using this weird command, which I totally got from the internet. Don't know how it works. Um, and yeah, I have written tests and I've commented them so our module would compile. So I'm going to uncomment them. And cool. All right, so this is our DSL. And this is what we'll be working with today. So like we discussed, we need a using macro, right? So, and it takes one argument, but we're not, we're not going to use it today. And we can import this current module, which where we can define, um, you know, a, a other macros like sequence and notes, right? We are using unquote module. That means at the time of definition, it gets evaluated to music, mixed music.dsl. And we also need to define a function play, um, which takes a sequence name and does something. <laughs> we'll get to this later. And we need a way to store the sequences in the module, right? So we can use a module attribute um, calling, call it sequences, which accumulate, which accumulates. It's a, basically that means it's a list, right? Of sequences. And we can use that to store that. All right, so let's, let's, let's do test-driven development or rather error driven development. So whatever errors we get, let's try to fix that. So it's undefined function sequence. We know it's a macro. So let's define a macro sequence. It should take um, a sequence name and a block. Great, so we need to define an attribute where we can store the current sequence. So we can register an attribute and call it current sequence. Great, and we can uncode the block. And the block is like, you know, note, uh, what uh, calling note, um, whatever module. Um, and um, that should update the current sequence. And then we can use sequences to store whatever the value of current sequence is. Um, we can use the key sequence name and uh, current sequence, which has a list of all notes to store that. One 
quick thing here. When we use module, uh, when we use accumulator, um, it puts uh, new elements at the beginning of the list because it's faster. So we need to reverse this uh, to get like expected um, order. And once we're done storing it, we can delete attribute current sequence so it can be used in the future by a different sequence. All right, let's run it again. Error undefined function note, great. Now we need a note macro, which takes a class and options. And what that does is it adds the, a note to the current sequence. But since it can only be called inside a sequence, we need to check if current sequence is defined. If it's not defined, we need to raise node can only be called inside a sequence. And if it is defined, we can use a current, we can use this helper function that I wrote earlier, node from options, which takes a class and options and returns a note. And we can append that note, or I guess rather prepend the note to current sequence. Um, awesome. Let's run the test again. Fails because embed notes isn't defined. Uh, so similarly, we'll define a macro embed notes, takes a sequence name. This is tricky now because we need to, we cannot just add node directly here. We need to access the module attribute to get nodes for a sequence, right? Because embed nodes is an already defined sequence. So let's do that. Um, again, this should be called inside a current sequence. Else we can raise embed nodes can only be called inside a sequence. Cool. And let's define a function. It says notes from sequence takes a module and a sequence name, right? And we know that uh, an attribute sequences is defined. So we can use that, get attribute sequences. We can do keyword dot get sequence name. Great, so this returns a list of notes that correspond to a sequence. So we can do notes equals note from sequence we're going to pass current module and sequence name. Then for each node, we'll basically do what node does, which is add to the current sequence. Great. Um, let's try to see if this does something now. Okay, it at least compiles. Um, Awesome. So now we have a list of sequences when the module is defined, but we need access to them even after the module is defined. So we can use before compile hook. And remember, this gets invoked at the very end, even though I'm registering it at the very top. Uh, and we can define before compile over here. Which defines a function sequences and just returns the module attribute sequences. So now we have a way to get sequences from a module after it's compiled. So let's hope five failures goes, go down with this. Three failures, great. Um, now let's get to this play thing, right? So we need a way to, we have access to all the sequences. We need a way to play sequences now. So let's uh, define a function play sequence which takes a module and a sequence name. We know that all the sequences are defined in at sequences, which we can get through this function, underscore underscore sequences. So we can call module dot sequences and try to do keyword get with sequence name, right? And this could be nil to the sequences and define. So I'm gonna do a case over here. If it's nil, we can raise um, sequence, sequence name, not defined. 
um, let's type it right there. Um, else, if it's notes, we can do um, enum.each, notes, and we can use a note player that I've defined here, which takes a note to play a note. We can use that. Um, note player dot play. So that should play all our notes. So now uh, we can use that over here. And again, this is what I was saying earlier, minimizing your meta code. I have defined a play sequence function over here instead of inside the quote. And inside the quote, all we can do is just delegate to that function, right? And so you can test all your use cases of play sequence separately um, uh, without having to do your know, test your DSL. So uh, it takes a module and a sequence name. Okay, so let's run our test. Awesome, great. So that, all our tests pass. Uh, now another test, true test for whether this is working or not is, I mentioned earlier, there's a special track, uh, which I'm gonna uncomment. It's in a mix task. Um, let's do a mix final music. Let's see if you guys can tell what this is. I'm gonna let that play a little bit. I worked really hard on writing this entire code, as you can guess. <laughs> anyway, that's pretty much it. Uh, that's actually it for the talk. Um, do we have any questions? First of all, I'm just gonna clap for that amazing <laughs> musical performance. That was so cool. I mean, live coding, like you said, is always daunting, you know, guaranteed to go great. And you just made it seem super easy. Um, yeah, I'm blown away. That was so excellent to see. Um, so if folks have questions, please bring them in through the Q&A and I will pose them to Adi. But I've got a question or a couple questions for you. But I'll start with, um, I feel like I'm probably not alone in saying I've maybe had some bad experiences with metaprogramming, you know, in general in Elixir because it can get messy and it can get complex. So I'm curious if you have any thoughts on that, your own maybe horror stories to share or some tips and tricks for avoiding getting, you know, mired in overly complex metaprogrammed code? Yeah, I, I have, um, well, I, yeah, start doing Elixir like as my first job, you know, I, my, my first job was in Elixir too. I have made a lot of bad decisions with metaprogramming, um, written a lot of code, which is hard to maintain. Um, again, it like comes down to, uh, you know, there's like really three things like, like you said, it gets really messy, so it's hard to read, right? So I think the separation of interface from implementation, just being as explicit about it as you can. Um, and I mean, if you can separate interface from implementation, like sometimes it's also okay to test what your uh, macros uh, evaluate to individually. Uh, I know it, uh, people say that it's better to test the final behavior of a meta program than the actual uh, code itself, but it's sometimes it's not feasible, right? Uh, so that's one. And uh, like I mentioned earlier, just making the code more inspectable, um, like here adding the underscore underscore sequences function, I could have uh, done it a little differently, but like, you know, say things stop working, you can always like hook into your module, open up an IEX and see what sequences are defined as, right? Like, just like, can you, can you like hook into your meta program in, in the middle somewhere and see if things are as expected, just as intentionally can be about us, that's better. And again, exa another example here is like, you know, uh, adding the fact that node can only be called from inside a sequence, right? And like running a test for that. Uh, so just being as intentional about your usage of your DSL, uh, the more intentional you are, the less likely it'll go bad. But I mean, it is more complex coded than it, it is going to take, you're, you're uh, increasing the amount of time it will take to maintain for the maintainer of the meta program at the expense of decreasing the time uh, for people who will use the meta program, right? So uh, that's always, uh, that's always, the, I guess, uh, thing you have to weigh. Yeah, excellent. Thanks. I feel like it's tough because you want to reach for metaprogramming, like to make it easier for other people to extend their code and use it for a general purpose. But I also noticed you called out, 
one of the like when to use metaprogramming points was like when you have requirements that aren't going to change or when they're as fixed as possible. So those things are like almost at odds with each other. You have to sort of reconcile them. But yeah, yeah I think that was that was great advice. A um, couple more questions coming in. Um, one of them got up, upvoted here. Will you upload a Super Mario OST played by an Elixir DSL video on YouTube? Sure. <laughs> yeah, go for it, man. Yeah. And there's also a question in the chat, um, folks asking if you'd be willing to share the code for this project. So maybe that's yeah. something that you'll post as a link for later. Definitely. I, I will work with the code uh, coaching team and e either it'll be on you know the conference page or my GitHub. I'll make sure it's available. Awesome. Thank you. Um, all right. Some other questions coming through. I posted one that I won't try, I'll try not to hog too much of the question asking, but it did get upvoted. Are there ways in your opinion that Elixir specifically is a good fit for metaprogramming, maybe compared to some other languages? Um, yeah, and again, I, I don't have a lot of experiences with other languages. I, I'll compare this with Ruby because there's a, definitely an overlap with the Ruby community. In Ruby, like, the way it's, it, it's, it's a great language. I think it's a great language to like, you know, play around and experiment things with, but in production code with open classes and stuff like that level of flexibility, you can literally, you can literally do whatever you want, you know, and Elixir, when it's a module is compiled, it's compiled, right? And I, I love that fact. And using that as foundation, there's so many other ways, uh, each of this feature that the way it's been introduced, like code.eval coded needs to have a environment you can pass, right? And there's a, a way, it, uh, there's a macro way of doing that instead of doing code or eval coded, right? Or uh, on definition only allows functions, not macros. So there's like ways in which Elixir restricts you uh, while still kind of making you not feel restricted, <laughs> uh, liberated enough to extend it. Uh, I like that balance uh, when I compare with Ruby at least. Uh, it, I think it's significantly better than that, so. Yeah, I really appreciate the guardrails that Elixir provides because I feel like it's definitely possible to make a mess with your Elixir metaprogramming, but it's very easy to get yourself back yourself into some really crazy corners with uh, Ruby metaprogramming, just given how dynamic it is uh, when you're in an object oriented world. All right, some more questions coming through. Is it possible to do something like expand macro like Lisp does? Uh, I mean, to see a resulting code that is produced by the DSL. Um, yeah, so actually, let me share my screen again. That it's one oh, of the awesome. tests. Um, it's one of the tests. It's again not a great way to test things, but if you have an integration test, it's it's not bad to have that as a unit test too. Um, so one of the tests is right. So the mm -hmm. sequences function delegates to sequences, so you can quote this, and you can test the macro dot two string version of what you expect and what is expanded. It's like you're, you're not testing, you're testing literal equivalence at this point, right? Like if you change, if you add a new line or whatever, right? It will like not be same, but uh, at least you're testing your, your actual code, like literal equivalence, not logical equivalence. But uh, yeah, you can use like macro dot two string to get like string version of your code. Uh, or you, I mean, again, we are, we've already talked about like code.eval to get like the value of the code if you want to also test the logical equivalence, but yeah. Excellent, thank you. Yeah. All right, one last question and we have a few minutes left. Do you have some anecdotes about how a DSL saved your life in a real world application? I'm a huge fan of object oriented programming, but the theme sounds scary to people around me. Maybe some happy stories about metaprogramming will help. Yeah, it, uh, well, one of the, places was, uh, uh, like, like I mentioned earlier, since we picked Elixir very early uh, at, at my first company, we were like a small shop and um, we were like a Ruby on Rails heavy place. And with like lack of, I guess, uh, you know, uh, mod like, like libraries like Capistrano and Ruby on Rails, which is like sets everything up for you and deploys, right? Uh, uh, I, I built a, a library that allowed us to do that. Uh, it was like right after we uh, deployed our first project, it, it basically generated your deploy task and everything. And without DSL, we would not have been able to make it, uh, you know, uh, a little bit more inextendable. You know, it's a great way to uh, like standardize most of the things while keeping a few things flexible, right? Like DSL is good. And I know like most and few is like a relative term and what is most for you, you have to figure that out. And that's where it's like hard to decide 
is this a good candidate for, for DSL? But um, if you guys want to check out the library, it's called AKD. Uh, it's open source, but uh, I, I'm not really sure if it's like used anymore at that company. I'm not at that company anymore, but I wrote that like a while ago in 2017. Uh, but that really saved us um, uh, quite a lot of time. Excellent. Thank you for sharing that as well. Um, we do have three minutes left. If there are any last questions, I see a question from Robert in the chat, but I'm not in the chat, but I'm not sure if you mean to show the first example module again. If you want to come off mute, uh, Robert, to clarify that, feel free. Yeah, yeah, it, it was to show show the example module. Just me. Okay. Uh, so the example. Um, you showed a very you showed a very simple example when you started off. Right, right, right. The DS, the Phoenix router. No, a bit further down. Okay. Um, he says it was a module. He said. Yeah, the module further down, further down. Uh, this one probably. Uh, no, of using the macros, of using the macros. Oh, you uh, using mac? Oh, okay, this one. No, nope, no, nope, no. Nope. Keep going. Keep do you going. mean the module that Adi wrote to use his music macro? Yeah, showing showing the sequence show, first time. Showing the sequence. Oh, right, right, right. Oh, Here yeah, I would love to see that. That's, that, that's, that's the really one. Beautiful. That's the one. That's the one. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Yep. Yeah. So see again, it was like inspired by Phoenix router for like multiple reasons because I mean it, it it's a very it's a great example. Everyone uses that, and uh, it, you know just. And implementing something like this live, people might like feel like they know a little bit about how Phoenix router works, right? So like replace like sequence with pipeline and replace, replace notes with plug. Hmm. Right, thank you. That's great. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, that just reads so beautifully, Adi. I think it's a really nice example of just the power of metaprogramming to create a super eloquent DSL. Hmm. Awesome, thanks.